Welcome to Understanding the Gospel and our series Talking Truth. Today's question is, is the church all about control? Now, some of us like control, don't we, Graham? Yeah. And, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. But is the church, is that all the church is about? Perhaps one of the first things we need to do is define what church is. And I think in the New Testament, the church was formed in the book of Acts where those who believed the message of the gospel were baptized and they gathered together as part of a company of God's people. Now, in Acts 2, where the believers were baptized after being saved and were gathering together, they sold their possessions and they put them together as a part of a communal fund and then that was distributed to whatever need. Now, people looking on at that will say, well, that is an awful lot of control. They're selling lands, they're selling houses, and they're, they're placing that at the apostles' feet. And is it therefore something that uh, I need to do uh, to be part of a church? Does it mean that I'm relinquishing all of my autonomy? What do you think? Well, I think, drawing on Acts chapter 2, what you said there, what we, say, what we see it clearly in that passage anyway, is that people had a choice whether they did that yeah. or not do that. And then... When they did do that, they actually didn't have to give everything yeah. in there. That was all completely still under their choice. The problem in Acts uh, chapter 2, of course, as we see later on and going through, is that some people uh, did sell or sell what they had and then pretended to give everything yeah. that they had see, as well. You're referring to Ananias and Sapphira. Who, in Acts 5, when they did lie to the Holy Spirit, then Peter says to them, he says, was it not in your own power mm. to hold on to it or to sell it? So I think that that, as you rightly point out, kind of counters this argument that the church was taking, whereas actually it was more about the fact that there was a need that had arisen, people were poor, so it was just that part of the fellowship. I guess you, you've, got to, you've got to remember the circumstances in Acts as well, don't you? Um, this is when the church was first formed. Um, people were in Jerusalem um, for the festival. Many of them didn't live there, um, and they were they were converted. Uh, they were staying in Jerusalem, and there, there were a lot of needs that had to be met. Um, so there were particular circumstances behind that behaviour in in Acts chapter two. Um, but I guess what it, what it does demonstrate is that that here is a group of people who have been brought together in a very uh, close manner and um, they've got a deep care for one another and they consider each other's needs to be their own and as, as Paul brought out that was that was very much a voluntary thing mm. um, and I suppose it speaks to the the nature of what it means to be um, in God's family in the widest sense a, a, a Christian uh, is, is a member of of the church in the very broadest sense um, but also that's expressed locally in a church as we yeah. meet with other Christians and as we uh, serve with them together. And, it and goes to the very heart needs. of why someone would, would be part of a church, Absolutely. which is that it is not an, uh, something that's imposed upon you, but it's something that you do and that you commit to because you're attracted, not to an organisation, but you are attracted to join your lives together with those that you share in common this a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Saviour. Um, you've been brought into the family of God, and so you want to share your life, as the Bible instructs us to, not to live our lives um, in an isolated way from other Christians, but together in community. And, you know, one of the issues I think that comes up is that sometimes these communities have been dysfunctional and have behaved in a way the Bible says that a church should never behave, and asserted control and uh, abusive control sometimes when that's not what the Bible teaches about what a church ought to be. And that's a failure if that takes place um, because it's not a question of control as such, imposing control on people, but rather I think it is the idea of learning what pleases God and there should be within the heart of a Christian a desire to do that as we are indwelt with the Spirit of God and we get taught um, what that means in daily life through the Bible. 
and uh, there are people who have the responsibility within churches to do that teaching and also um, to um, hold us accountable to that teaching, not to just whatever we think or whatever structure we put in place. I think, I think sorry, I need to go I was just say, one of the areas where that control has come about is, is when uh, uh, there's been a, an organisation formed that consists of a lot of churches as opposed to a local church. Uh, and uh, the order that the New Testament seems not to, not seems to the order the New Testament teaches is uh, that local churches are independent uh, and they are governed by elders uh, who are raised up by God for that local church uh, and they're not under the jurisdiction or control of some body that uh, uh, oversees all the churches. Uh, and that's one of the what, one of the lose, areas where we've gone. Then you, then you lose focus on the whole point. It's, it's the person of the Lord Jesus Christ and, and the centre of all the gatherings. And he's the purpose and the whole reason why we meet together in that way. So he's the one really that's in control of these things. But I think there's one other point that we need to be aware of, is that even within the confines of uh, an independent, autonomous local assembly, that if it is the case that your culture is that you are isolating yourself from society, you might only ever employ believers. You might only want to ever get a loan from a fellow believer. And, you, and therefore what happens inadvertently is that the church ends up exerting a huge amount of control over every aspect of your life. And that if you were to ever disagree with that church, to leave the church is you're not just leaving the church, you're leaving often your family, you're leaving your job, you're leaving your home and your house because there are certain groups of Christians or maybe so-called Christians that actually that's how it functions. So I think it's important to keep in mind that even within that kind of structure of an autonomous church that it's the way that we interact with the wider culture and society is important and that we don't isolate ourselves from the society that we live in. It's very interesting <clears throat> we've, we've spoke about uh, an autonomous church because one of the uh, discussions I had with a friend once, uh, he was in a, a denomination and he says, I'm, I'm in favour of that because it gives some accountability to, to, to a church. You know, he says, I, I don't like the idea of a, a single church because then that can run wild with no accountability um, to, to others. What, what would you say to my, my friend who raised that point? I, well, yeah, go ahead. well okay. I, I would say that we have to keep in mind that, the, that God has given to us everything that we need to live a godly life in the Word of God. If God wanted some form of federation or denominational structure, he would have provided it, that teaching in the book of Acts or in the New Testament, but he hasn't. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I think that what we can see is the fact that there is a deliberate uh, situation and teaching in the New Testament where each church is autonomous and there isn't that kind of overarching however practical benefits might be gained from that there's also certain things which are lost and church history has told us that over the last 2,000 years that it's counterintuitive but whenever we try to organize churches together whether it be in a Presbyterian or kind of an Anglican or congregational system it always fails. And that the only thing that actually produces unity and help for churches which are weak is when we actually practice autonomy. Mm -hmm. So my, uh, a, f a friend is, is in a church where she's being told uh, what type of job she should have and she's been told who she should marry and where she should buy a house and how much money she should, she should give. Sounds like a lot of control, doesn't it? Really? Is, is that, that legitimate? Well, I think that with all these things, there are, there are degrees. So, for example, um, if you are in a local church, part of becoming part of a local church, part of becoming part of a local church, is the recognition that God has provided a structure whereby there is order and authority, which is actually characteristic of himself because God's a God of order and authority. And so that order and authority is set out in the Bible. And we've, we've, we've spoken a wee bit about that. So you do have spiritual authority, and that has to be recognised in order to, for the church to function. Um, so in the New Testament, the authority within a local church were the uh, elders who are raised up of God, who are to be of a certain character as set out in Scripture. 
um, and had to be accountable to the Lord Jesus Christ, who's called the chief shepherd, and elders are called shepherds. And so there is a hierarchy of authority um, in that sense. You have the, the local church, you have the elders, and then you have the Lord Jesus Christ, who is ultimately authoritative in the local church. And these local elders' authority can never go beyond the scope of that which is given to them by Christ, mm -hmm. yeah. which is the word of God. Mm -hmm. And so um, it is not enough for an elder of any church to say, you must do this, full stop, or I want you to do that, full stop. The only authority an elder has is that this is what the scriptures say, um, and our expectation as elders is that we and you would conform to what the scripture says for these reasons. Mm -hmm. And it's not a negative thing. Um, it's a positive thing to glorify God by so doing. And that does impact things like, for example, how we manage your finances. Mm -hmm. Not to the degree of me saying you should spend your money on this, you should spend your money on that. Can't even do that in my own family, never mind in a local church. But in the sense of where our priorities lie, the Bible speaks about that. Um, in terms of relationships, um, the Bible does not give elders authority to say you must marry a certain person. But it does give elders the responsibility of making sure that people don't make a wrong decision in that a Christian would choose to marry someone that's not a Christian. So in that sense, the, the, it's quite right. And the church, or through the elders, has every right to say you cannot marry that person if Scripture clearly teaches that that's not a suitable person for a Christian to marry, i.e. they're not a Christian. So the authority is with the scriptures. Correct. Yeah. I want her to put it this way, uh, that between elders and members, there should be an open Bible, and the Bible is authority over both. Um, yeah. It's the ultimate source. It's the, it's the uh, elders which are among you. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. yes. 1 Peter 5, verse 1, I was just going to quote that. Yes. Yeah, so, so, so really, just to reiterate what, what Graham said, the only authority that... That the, the teachers in a local assembly, the elders have, is the authority given to them by... So the what church. happens in your example, if someone in a local church um, has their elders imposing something upon them or asking them to do something and they're uncomfortable with it or they feel that, it is, uh, that it's gone beyond that scope of authority, what advice would you give such a person? Uh, in, the, in those set of circumstances, because that, you know, that can, because of the fact that elders uh, and a few of us at this table function as elders mm. um, are all flawed, sinful human beings yeah. um, and make mistakes. Yeah, you know, what recourse would, would a person have in these circumstances? I would ask them, you know, if they're being told to do something and if they, they're not clear that it's in scriptural doubt, that even in scripture say, could, could you, you know, could we get together and could you show me? Uh, where what you're saying is in the scriptures because you want to be like those Bereans as we read about who examined the scriptures to see what they do. don't just take it in I think one of the problems uh, we have is people just sort of uh, listen to what they hear from a pulpit or, or whatever and say that's what I must do in a brainwashed or indoctrinated but as a, as a Christian you always say to people well examine what I'm saying is that true and if you don't think that is true come back and ask. And if it can't be clearly demonstrated that what I'm saying is through the scriptures, then you can disregard it. Just disregard that. Then, of course, I guess if that control is still being exerted, that then asks a different question, should I be in that place? I think there's also another point, and I remember we had an experience, and our assembly was involved in a children's work. And what happened was that the, one of the younger sisters objected to something that was being done. Now, you couldn't really say from scripture that this was a biblical issue, but there was an issue of authority. And she, according to our conscience, couldn't, she felt uncomfortable doing what, was, what the children's work was doing. Um, it was how we were dealing with a particular individual. And what the advice that was given to her was that, well, even if you disagree with this, you can submit as unto the Lord. And it's, it's not contravening the scriptural teaching. She knew that. She knew that. She, didn't, she wasn't saying, well, there's a verse here that says we need to do this. It was just how she thought and felt about it. But what she could do is that she could submit to that authority uh, because it honoured the Lord, even if she didn't agree with it. But yeah, I think when you're coming to an issue of 
it's a biblical principle, then it's a, it's a different issue. But how far do those biblical issues extend? So we've got um, lots of issues in life that often we, when we come up against different individuals in a local church context, and there are different ways of doing things like, how far does the Bible actually teach on these issues? So, for instance, does, a, does what could uh, elders teach in terms of how parents parent, for instance? What, how far could they go on those kind of issues? As far as the Bible goes. Okay. Which I know is a very... No, it's not a trite answer because actually that is the answer. Okay. Um, and... Um, if if you go beyond that answer, you know, then you yeah, go beyond our, scripture. Yeah, you're into our personal preference and how, mm -hmm. how to do things, which is just completely opposite of what. So I then, the, the question for that particular issue is: How far does the Bible go? Not how far do the elders go? Yeah. Um, so how far does scripture go? And it's also not how far are the elders allowed to go? Because uh, the reality is, I think it's how far should the elders go? Because it's usually the other way about in the sense that um, as elders we often are deficient in not going far enough rather than um, in the, not going far enough. It's easy to assert control on superficial things and ask people to draw in line and conform with the established practice of something. That's a simple thing. It's harder um, and probably more fruitful but harder to get involved in areas of daily life such as parenting. Um, or the management of finance. And or, marriage issues generally. And marriage issues. These are difficult areas, but the Bible does speak into them, mm -hmm. um, and helpfully so. But, you know, that's not control, that's shepherding. Yeah. Um, and that is time sensitive. Yeah. And, and, that, and that raises an important point of context because generally authority is viewed very negatively yeah. in our culture yeah. today, Absolutely. whereas actually the Bible speaks of it as something that God expects in different spheres of life, but it's ultimately for, for the good of, of humanity as a whole. Um, he expects it, for example, in, in government, um, there to be responsibility and authority uh, and those who are under government to submit. He expects it in the home and, and he expects it in the local church. And I think it's important to remember that, that ultimately the goal of all of this is, is, is the, the, the good of those uh, who are under authority um, and the fact that, that God holds those who are responsible uh, to account. I think that, that part of the problem with that is that when people look at authority in a local church, they can often, they don't see that there's a love to that. Mm -hmm. So in Corinth, there, there was an absence of love. So therefore the church was exhorted to confirm your love to the person that had previously been excommunicated. And there, when there is that practical demonstration of love, it, it can be a lot easier to accept what people are saying. None of us go into a hospital and say, why on earth is the doctor telling me to do this? Because we know that actually they're looking to do something that's for our benefit. Mm -hmm. And in a sense, that's what we should see in the local church. It is a hospital. Yes, yes one writer said that. That's one of the pictures of the local church is a hospital, really, for caring for the sick. Yeah, so if... Uh our natural instinct, I suppose, before salvation is to not be controlled because of sin, so uncontrollable in a certain sense. So if we have someone in our church, so to speak, who is behaving and doesn't want to be controlled by, by the, the shepherds, would that sort of person, would there be no life in that person, no new life, no spiritual life in that person? Well, quite possibly, because the gospel should change us and the gospel should make us want to submit to the Lord because he's the one that bought us. But there are times where that might be evident that a person isn't a genuine believer, but there might even as believers, we all struggle. Yeah, and I think that you rightly point out, it's, it is part of our culture today. And mm -hmm. possibly the, the question itself that we're trying to answer is, is a question, in, especially relevant in our 21st century, where we're all very autonomous individuals. We don't like being told what to do, but yet the gospel changes that. And I think that it's important that for those who do teach or those who exercise oversight, that we, we look at the gospel issue that is often relevant in every situation, whether it's a marital conflict, whether it's a parenting issue, it, the gospel is central to that. And it's been trying to identify what aspect of the gospel is relevant in that situation and ministering that to an individual. I think as well that um, one thing that's often 
resisted, I think, in relation to uh, authority, and sometimes it's interpreted as control, as a call to repentance, mm. which is so often in the Bible necessary because of human behavior. It's necessary in salvation. God can't have a relationship with us until we repent of our sin and the sin is dealt with. And then as Christians, we still need to repent because although our sins are judicially forgiven, um, we are still sinning and we, that still impacts our relationship with each other. And so in the Bible, um, when the Lord Jesus writes his letters at the beginning, Revelation chapter 2 and 3, um, to these churches corporately, these seven churches, there was a call to repentance. Mm -hmm. And their behavior needed to change. And I think sometimes people may have issues and feel controlled by the church when the church, through the elders, are calling them to repent ultimately of sin and of relationship issues because this happens mainly in relationship issues mm -hmm. and when people have problems or fallout or something happens and the elders are called to intervene and bring about peace and a solution and a reconciliation the part and parcel of that is often one or both parties have to repent and ultimately, it's a repentance toward God first yeah. uh, in that situation as well. And uh, because we lose sight of the need for that ongoing repentance towards God, first of all, in daily living, uh, then that's why we struggle sometimes with the repentance towards other people. But that's not control. No. That's an, uh, that is, that is a, 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 a necessary um, um, a necessary outcome of authority functionings that should in, in a local church, which is that there are times when we're going to be called to repentance mm -hmm. um, and we don't like it. We just don't like well, the it. The flesh doesn't like it. Yeah. 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 And, and so there is that, there's that pushback against that. But it's important to recognise that it's all to do with the heart because we're not talking about just imposing standards of behaviour on people yeah. because actually the way the gospel works is God changes us on the inside and then that's, that's worked out in our life. I mean, Romans 12 talks about how we're to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and God changes us on the inside, uh, changes our mind, and then that's worked out. Um, it's not the idea of an external mould being pressed down upon us just to keep our behaviour in check. So what happens if someone won't? Yeah, that's, what, that's, the, that's the, the key question, isn't it? So if we're just, if we're in relation to, let me ask the question then, if we're in relation to control, if someone resists authority, so the, the elders come and say this particular thing is sin in relation to the Bible, um, there needs to be repentance um, for whatever. Put it in the context perhaps of two people who have and their relationships broken down, they've fallen out over something uh, and there's a call to repentance um, by the elders, which is biblical. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the parties involved in the dispute, or maybe both, um, won't do it and uh, they resist so do the elders then just sit back and say well we well, that's it I think what happens I think Matthew 18 plays a bit onto that it doesn't play a bit plays a, a good bit into that doesn't it it's a it's a process that the Lord Jesus speaks about if your brother sins against you go and tell him his fault between you and him alone and hopefully there'll be repentance there'll be resolution within that if that doesn't happen, he goes on to say, take one or two others with them. And hopefully those witnesses will encourage him to repent mm -hmm. and come to that. If he doesn't do that, you need to tell it to the whole church, to the whole local church. And the issue for the church is, is then call that brother or sister to repent of, of this issue. Yeah, and and trust they will. If and they agree with the issue that's been brought to them, course, the, the church may feel that actually the people who have brought the issue are in the wrong. And if the church says actually you're in the wrong, then the church deals with it. But it's a church decision then to say we agree that on this particular issue, whatever it may be, this is what the Word of God teaches and this is how repentance is worked out. Yeah. And then, of course, the final step in that four part process if he or she refuses to listen, even to the church, let him to be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. So that's to be sort of removed from, you know, it's very sad out of the local fellowship with the idea is that they'll see that as so serious and that they'll then repent and come back. The idea of the discipline process is as in when you parent your child is that they will, you know, feel sorry and, and then yeah. return. 
This process isn't something that will happen over a week or so. This is a, this is a process possibly over months, even, even uh, longer than that in these things. There's patience, because God is patient. And that's consistent with what Paul teaches in 1 Corinthians 5, where the person is put out <coughs> and for the destruction of the flesh, yes. which is, I think, a reference to the fact that the sinful pattern of behavior yes. is repented of. It's not the destruction of the body. No. The church has no authority to make people suffer physically, although in the history of the church, it has. It doesn't have any exercise to, over its uh, an individual's financial situation. The only authority uh, it can exercise in the word of God is that they're basically put out of fellowship mm -hmm. until at some point when the repentance is made, they're brought back in. So what happens if the control, control is illegal? I think that's a good point, Stephen. That's a very good question. What does someone do when yeah. there are things within a church that are breaking the law in behavioural terms, and someone is uh, being uh, treated in an abusive fashion, um, and the church is saying to that person, no, we are going to take control of this situation. Mm. Um, do not go to anyone outside the church. Um, it's our situation to deal with and uh, take control of that situation in that way, which, as we know, happens. And it, it's a very big issue. Yeah, well, that, I mean, most, what's been the headline in recent years, of course, is the issue of abuse, isn't it, of, of, of children, you know, and we've sadly seen that in, in, in churches. It shouldn't be, but it has, has been there. And, that, I mean, every church should have a safeguarding policy in our, in our country and probably in every country anyway and th those things to take that that if it's suspected child abuse that should be re reported straight to, to the governing authorities the police um, straight away for them to deal with that as per the laws mm -hmm. in the land there's, there's no doubt about that that it, i think in any of our Does minds that go here, beyond the child issue because um, sometimes there may be a thought well the law of the land doesn't apply within the church I think, that's not, that's I think not something's right. illegal, something's illegal. Yeah, yeah well, we, have a, we have a responsibility to the laws of our land to uphold them. And if the law states that it has to be reported, it has to be reported. Um, but obviously in a civil matter where it's between two people, again, the First Corinthians 6 teaches mm. you don't go to law against brother. You set it before the church to decide that's not on it. That's the criminal context, but that's, which that's is very exact, important to The distinction between the civil and the criminal is important, yeah. Uh, absolutely. And I guess the only time where the church wouldn't report it to the authorities might be in a place where the law is against, explicitly against God's law. So the church is doing something and that, that's it in accordance with scripture. Yeah. The governing authorities have said that's against our law. Yeah. In that case, you wouldn't. God's law is supreme. That would above be true in a lot of countries already. Yeah, yeah. A abs absolutely. You know, um, I was thinking, you know, back, you know, to this autonomy of the local church. And I think we see God's wisdom go going back is that in churches, he calls for elders in every church. There is not one person mm -hmm. who is the, the governing authority in a church. So the, the, we see even the, the wisdom of God in that, can't we? In a plurality of elders, not it's one man above them. Right? Absolutely, absolutely. Because... The sinful flesh, which we all have, can desire control. And you hear of the word control freak, don't you? Mm -hmm. And so you can see in God's wisdom that a plurality of elders will we, diminish that in, in many cases. Yeah, there's a bit of balance. The point Stephen made at the start, but mm -hmm. that, yes, the, the shepherds are there locally, but there is the chief shepherd, you know, there's one who's yes. in control. And that's the Absolutely. point to realise and understand. Yeah, and that sets the, the character of leadership and authority in the local church, doesn't yeah. it? He has set the ultimate example because he gave his life for the sheep uh, who are the church. Yeah. Um, and therefore, elders uh, are to care for uh, the members of a local church after the example of, of Jesus Christ who gave himself sacrificially for them. Which kind of brings us kind of back to the, where we started in that you were, as you rightly said, that the church belongs to Christ. It's not our church, it's not my church, 
it's the Lord's church. Mm -hmm. So therefore, that's where the authority comes. So as individuals, all we can do is take the authority that the Lord gives to elders mm -hmm. in the exercise of authority, be that to help us understand what the Word of God teaches, to help us implement that in our life. And when things do mm -hmm. stutter in that process, that and as any loving parent would do to correct their child, then so do elders in a local church context. So authority is that which is derived from the Word of God and it's exercised before the chief shepherd who every elder will have to give an account of. And obviously Hebrews talks about the fact that hopefully they'll be able to do that with joy and not with grief. <laughs>